Customs and traditions, fine arts, literature, and science. Sanatana Dharma is Jnana Kosha, the rich treasury of knowledge. Our Guru Parampara, starting from Sadashiva all the way down to the present Guru, is a sturdy boat of knowledge. Jnana Lauka. It is sailing on the river of knowledge, Jnana Vahini. This Jnana Nauka is carrying all the Gurus, Rishis, Muni and Darshanikas who are all holding Jnana Kosha with utmost care and love. This boat is driven and guided by none other than Jnaneshwari Sharadamba, who is magnetically attracting all individuals by sprinkling Jnana Sudha, the nectar of knowledge, all through the way. Jnana is immortal, Amrita. It is sweet and nourishing like Sudha milk. This Jnana Sudha is very essential to every individual to realize the supreme truth, Brahma Satya. With the blessings of Devi Sharadamba and our Sringeri Sri Jagat Gurus, 
SVB of Canada is having the vision of conducting Jnana Sudha as an ongoing satsanga with scholars, revered Swamiji's of various ashramas, artists, through talks, lectures, demonstrations, workshops, and artistic presentations as well. Let us all take part in sipping this Jnana Sudha to become a real good human being as well as to grow as divine being. Om Shri Gubhyo Namaha. Uh, my name is uh, Param Bhatt. I am a trustee of uh, Shringeri Vidya Bharati Foundation. Uh, in brief, it's called SVBF Canada. Uh, on behalf of SVBF Canada, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Aravind Gudi and all the viewers uh, of this Jnana Sudha. Just as a short background, SVBF is a foreign affiliate of Shringeri Mutt in Karnataka, India, and this was established in the year 2010 with the blessings of Shringeri Jagadgurus. We are constantly guided by them uh, in all our activities. At SVBF Canada, we have a Shardamba Temple, a Adi Shankara Museum, and a community center. Various activities from children to seniors take place here, both the spiritual uh, and other uh, health-related issues. Jnana Sudha is a one in a series of lectures we host by eminent speakers on Sanatana Dharma. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor Aravind Gudi to talk to us on the secret of success in uncertain times or lessons from Vedanta. Dr. Aravind Gudi has been studying and practicing Vedanta for more than 30 years. He was fortunate and blessed to gain this knowledge from the spiritual masters and teachers of Chinmaya Mission and also Vedanta Society. He passionately shares his knowledge and experience through discourses, workshops, and study sessions. Dr. Goody is an associate professor of decision sciences at Nova Southern Southeastern University in Fort, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He has founded the Mindfulness Society at NSU and conducts seminars workshops and study groups. So a very warm welcome to, to you, Professor Goody, and please, please take over. Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunatu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejas Vinavadhi Tamas Tumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Tevo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha First of all, my sincere thanks to the uh, volunteers, the committee members of SPBF, uh, Nyana Sudha, for uh, organizing this program and giving me this wonderful opportunity to share this teachings of Vedanta uh, with you all who are interested in this subject. 
So uh, thank you for inviting me. Our topic today is secret of success in uncertain times. So the question comes, why is this a secret? It's not because somebody is trying to withhold this information or, or prevent us from knowing, but more so because this subject, the meaning of success, it's not clearly understood by most people. Many of us, we do not know how to interpret the meaning of success. Many of us, we do not understand how to follow the paths to success. So success can mean different things to different people. It can be interpreted in different ways. For example, something very popular is the meaning of success, the metric of success can be the amount of wealth that a person can have, money and investments, uh, properties and cars and so many other things. So for example, we are in South Florida. So what's popular for us is a, a sign of wealth and success could be uh, a grand beachfront property, a mansion, maybe uh, some boats out there. And the uh, interpretation of success in Toronto might be something else. But the metric of success depends on these kinds of measures, you know, wealth and property and uh, material things that we own. Another common example could be the meaning of success is tied to some fancy titles. I am the CEO of some company and we produce these amazing uh, products, manufacture these amazing products, state-of-the-art uh, technology, electric vehicles or uh, artificial intelligence and so on. Another meaning of success could be academic prowess, lots of accomplishments and uh, research and grants and, and those kinds of things. Something commonly known to many of us is the accomplishments someone might have in sports and athletics or uh, grand performances, musicians, uh, maybe vocal, maybe instrumental, or in the arts and sciences, great uh, artists, great actors, they get accolades and awards all the time. So these could be some commonly understood measures of success. Please understand by themselves, these measures are, of success are okay. There's nothing wrong with them. However, if you think about it, there is one big problem if we interpret the meaning of success along these lines, based on material things, based on the material world. There's a big problem, which is that all of these are going to be temporary. None of this is going to be permanent. In Vedanta, this is called as ephemeral. So these things will come, they can stay with you for a while and then go away. They are not going to be lasting here forever. For example, if my goal, if my desire, my ambition to gain success was to become very wealthy, become the wealthiest person in this world or become the wealthiest person in the country or a state or community, whatever your measure is, if that's my goal and ambition, if that is how I'm going to measure success, then I may reach it. It may take years and decades of hard work and effort to get to that point. And then there is a fine day when I become the wealthiest person. So I've gained my measure of success. However, the problem is tomorrow, if there is another person who has one dollar more than I have, then that's gone. I'm no longer the successful person. I'm no longer the wealthiest person in this context. The other example I gave you is the fancy titles. If I am the CEO and we are doing good work, which is fine, but then in the business world, you have these uh, mergers and acquisitions going on all the time. Right now, uh, the big news is the, the acquisition of uh, Twitter. 
So when these mergers and acquisitions happen, typically there is restructuring, the, uh, uh, the titles might go away, the uh, positions might go away. These things happen all the time. So somebody who was the CEO and tied his or her measure of success to that title, CEO, senior VP, it could be anything, then that's gone, it, it goes away. So once again, we are no longer successful. This we see happening all the time. If we depend on material factors in this world for our success, a great athlete who's doing fine and until yesterday, today, something else happened, it, it went away. Musicians, artists, actors, they're doing fine. They're doing great work. But something else changed. The, the tastes of the, the people, the audience, that changed. So then that success goes away. So these are all temporary measures. These are not going to be everlasting. So that is a clue. That is a clue for us that maybe this understanding of success, this way of measuring success is not correct. We have to change it because there are so many problems. So one more way to think about it is while we are engaged in these activities, trying to attain these successes, is it fulfilling? Deep down at the end of the day, having accomplished these things, do we feel calm, at peace, serene? Are we able to benefit others? Are we able to serve others in society, in the community? Do we feel fulfilled? If the answer to these questions is no, then most likely, most likely, these cannot be true measures of success. So now we need to look deeper to figure out what success means. And for that, Vedanta has given us a beautiful, a very elegant uh, framework or a, uh, a model, which is based on the four Purusharthas. Four Purusharthas. So Purushartha means the primary goals of life. So there are Artha, Kama, Dharma, and Moksha. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this. And we'll go a little more uh, detail into each one of these. Artha, in this context, it, it means the possession of wealth, material things, material belongings. It, it can be money, property, home, house, the different things that we need to survive. Kama means the fulfillment of our desires. This can happen at different levels also. So, Artha is, is the fundamental base. Artha is what gives us the ability to survive. It gives us some sense of uh, security, some sense of stability to survive in this world. It's at the very basic level. So those of you who may be familiar with Maslow's levels of hierarchy. So he explains it in a similar way. And this model is, is kind of parallel to it up to a point. So once we feel that we are reasonably secure, stable, reasonably we are able to survive, automatically the mind turns to the other desires that we may have. This can be at the physical level, it can be at the mental level, it can be at the intellectual level. We now seek to fulfill these desires, satisfy these desires. So that is the karma part of this framework. Now, most of the time, most of us, we are caught up in artha and kama. Once again, nothing wrong with that. Trying to gain security, feeling stable, feel, uh, surviving well in this world, and thereby trying to fulfill, trying to satisfy our material wants and desires. Nothing wrong with that by itself. However, if we don't understand this framework completely, there is one big problem. If we pursue artha, if we pursue kama, our desires, bereft of dharma, then that's going to be a problem. So dharma in Vedanta, it means something that supports, something that is able to withhold, something that sustains. That is the definition of dharma in 
Vedanta Shastra. We can interpret that at two levels. At a more basic level, dharma simply means righteousness, doing the right thing, doing that which is morally correct, that which is ethically right. We don't cause harm, uh, injury, pain to other people. We try to do the best we can to serve others through artha and karma. So that is at the more fundamental level. Swami uh, Chinmayanandji, he gives a much more very interesting way for us to understand what dharma means. He says dharma is the essence of something. It is that what makes it what it is. Hmm? Dharma is the essence of being for that object or thing, whatever it is. For example, if you take sugar, so the dharma of sugar is sweetness. If somebody gives you something and says this is sugar but it is not sweet, cannot be sugar. The essence of sugar being sugar is sweetness. Dharma of sugar is sweetness. Another common example is the sun. For us in the earth, in the solar system, the sun is the eternal source of light and heat. So the dharma of sun is light, heat. If the sun were to go dark, no light. If the sun were to become cold, not able to produce heat, then it cannot be sun. It cannot be the sun. So the dharma of the sun is light and heat. So what is the dharma for us as human beings? So here once again Vedanta Shastra says the dharma of us as human beings, every individual is to express our divinity within. What is the essential nature of each one of us as human beings? It is Brahman, pure consciousness. It is the understanding that I am not at the ego level, I am not this limited being identified with the body and the mind and the intellect, but something far beyond that transcends all these three. My essential nature is Brahman, pure consciousness, infinite, eternal. So how do I live up to this dharma through our lives if we are able to express this nature of ours, if we are able to express this divinity? So through every uh, thought, through every action, through every word, if I'm able to express this divinity, which is my essential nature, then that is living by dharma. So these are some ways for us to understand how to align artha, how to align karma with dharma. So if I pursue, a simple takeaway here is, if I pursue artha and karma, which is not dharmic, which is not dharmic, then that is not going to be right. It is going to create problems for me. It is going to be pro create problems for everybody else. So everything that we pursue in life, it has to be dharmic. So that now we get to the fourth purushartha, it should lead us to moksha. So the fourth purushartha, the goal of life, the ultimate goal of life is moksha. Moksha means, in Sanskrit, it means liberation, freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from bondage. Freedom from worldly life. A freedom from samsara is called. And more specifically, it is freedom from the cycle of life and death. The cycle of life and death. If we live primarily in artha kama without understanding the meaning of dharma, without understanding the highest goal of life, the ultimate goal of life, then we are going to get caught up and it will not lead us to the ultimate goal of life. So understanding this framework of four Purushartha given to us in Vedanta Shastra, it gives us a clearer understanding of the goal of life. Gives us a clearer understanding of how to interpret success. Gives us a better understanding of what pathways we can follow so that we can ultimately reach the highest goal of life. So this is one way to think about it. 
No, Vedanta also teaches us. Swami uh, Teju Mayananji has explained it so uh, beautifully that the purpose of Artha, this is a common understand, uh, misunderstanding we have. The purpose of Artha is not Kama, is not primarily for fulfilling our material desires. In fact, it is to follow Dharma. The purpose of Kama is to follow Dharma so that this is key. This alignment is key. So that through Artha, Kama and Dharma, we are able to reach the highest goal. So this is the ultimate goal of life. So we need to reflect on this sequence, this logical sequence of the four Purushartha, the four primary goals of life. So we are able to establish the context of each one of this. So going back to the earlier examples, there is nothing wrong in having those ambitions, those desires for wealth, for um, a title, for accomplishment, all those are fine. But we now need to put them in the context of these four Purushartha. It will clear our understanding of how to interpret success and how to reach success. Keeping in mind, keeping in mind that the highest goal of life is moksha, self-realization discovering my true nature, which is beyond BMI, body, mind, intellect, which is pure consciousness or Brahman. So this is something we need to reflect upon. Now, the other clause in our title today is uncertain times. Uncertainty. Now, if you think about it, is there anything in our life so far which has been certain? Is there anything which is certain? Looking into the future, is there anything that we can definitely say, this is what is going to happen in my life, in society, in the world? It's constantly uncertain. Let's keep in mind that these are external situations, the external circumstances in the world, which appear to be uncertain to me. For example, a, a student, we have the Brahmachari ashram, the first ashram, the first phase of life, which is commonly known as the student life, the first 20, 25 years of our life, where the student, the individual is focused on education and, and learning and so on to prepare for the next phase in life. Which part of that has been certain? So we start in the elementary school, middle school, high school, then it comes time to go to college. These young people, young teenagers, they are faced with so many uncertainties. Which college to go? Which university to apply for? How to get financial aid? Which discipline should I pursue? Should I go medicine or, or engineering or, uh, or law? or arts and sciences, social sciences, economics. There are so many options out there, choices out there. Which career is going to be uh, best for me, most suited for me so I can do well, be successful in this world? So many questions, so many uncertainties. In fact, I remember many years ago when I finished my uh, engineering, I got a bachelor's degree in uh, engineering, in electronics and telecommunication. At that time, this, there was this hype that the best uh, the, you know, engineering degree is going to be in electronics and telecommunication. So I went for that. <laughs> now, ironically, what happened is once I finished my engineering, I did not pursue that, that career at all. I totally went in a, in a, in a different way. And uh, interestingly, also all the other branches of engineering, they also did well. So which part of this was certain? Which part of this is going to give us some certainty in the future? The other day we were having a, a, a meeting with my faculty colleagues and one of the uh, our younger uh, faculty colleagues, he uh, got up and he said he had to leave to pick up his son from uh, preschool. So I asked him, how old is your son? <laughs> so he said, he's two years old. Two years old, this little child, he, has, he or she has no idea of what is certain, what is uncertain, but he's already in this flow. He's being pushed 
into all these different uh, frames of the world, which is going to lead to more and more uncertainty. So this is Brahmacharya Ashram, which is supposed to be education and learning and so on. The next phase in life, the logical phase is Grahastashram, which is the householder's life. This is where typically individuals uh, might choose to get married, settle down, have a family, jobs, careers, businesses, uh, different uh, whatever suits for you, different ways to earn money. So you get to provide for your family, take care of them. But one of the first things that you need to do in the householder life, Grahastashram, is let's say you want to get married. That itself is a big question mark because the boy is looking for the, the girl, woman of his dreams. The girl is looking for this, this boy of his dreams. He'll come on a white horse. And then they, they, they are looking, they are figuring out who to get married to. Uncertain, uncertainty, uncertainty everywhere. And maybe all it remains is a dream. You know, boy of my dreams, girl of my dreams. It's a lot of uncertainty. But let's say you, you figure out, you meet your life partner and settle down. Then there are more questions. You might have separate jobs and careers. So where are you going to settle down? Where do you want to get your, uh, uh, your house? Where do you want to buy your house so you can settle down? M maybe the, the boy or the girl, they have a a job career in, in South Florida, and maybe the other person has a job in, uh, in Toronto. So are you going to settle down in South Florida, South Florida or in Toronto? Big question, uncertainties. What is that going to mean to my future career? Or maybe you, both of them leave their jobs and say, well, we'll settle somewhere in between. Compromise. So <laughs> a lot of choices there. So once you are in Grahastha Ashram, there are even more and more uncertainties. Which jobs to pursue? I should be in this career for the next 10, 15, 20 years so I can take care of the family. Or should I go and do something else? Do my own uh, business. Is that going to be better for my family? Big, big questions, big uncertainties. Which job should I take up on? Which career should I take up on? Because you take up a job now based on some, uh, you know, you've got some advanced uh, predictions that this career is going to do well, but in a few years it goes away. It can go away and then you are back to uh, square one. So once again, there is a lot of uncertainties. It, it, this is the second uh, ashram, the grahastha ashram or the householder's life. Now, the third ashrama is vanaprastha ashram. Typically, we understand it as the ashram, the phase of life where we have retired. This is the retirement phase. So we are taken care of our responsibilities, our duties, obligations of family life towards the children. The children are grown up. They are on their own. So now I am free to retire. As soon as we think of retirement, the moment we think of retirement, there are more questions, more uncertainties. First of all, when do I retire? When do I retire? That becomes a big question. The other day I was having a, a meeting with my financial consultant. So he was advising me that if you want to retire in n number of years, then you have to look at your portfolio. This is your investments. So you need to start drawing on these kinds of accounts initially. Now, depending on if the market is doing well, you do these things. If the market is not doing well, then you have to do these kinds of things. It's very complicated. It made me wonder if it is worth retiring, maybe it is better to continue working. So that is one aspect which is uncertain, when to retire, where to retire, because you can think of going to a retirement home. There are these facilities which take care of older people, people who may not be doing so well physically, they may have health issues. So there are different kinds of retirement homes. They are located in different uh, places. Some of them cost more. They have different kinds of facilities. Some of them uh, may be less expensive, or different kinds of facilities. So where to retire? Because there are other things, factors, which we may want to consider about weather and proximity to the 
uh, the, the family. So some people think that once I retire, I want to be close to the children. I'm not sure if the children are expecting the same thing. So that is one factor. So lots of questions, lots of uncertainties there. Where to retire? How to retire? Should we continue working part-time? Many, many questions there. Grahastasham, uh, uh, the, the Vana Prastasham. So any ashram in life, these are the uncertainties which we always face. It, it is very interesting. But if we understand, if we understand that these uncertainties are in the external world, these are the external situation, what is one way we can take care of some uncertainties? We can create some certainty in this vast ocean of uncertainties. One way to do that is going back to Vedanta Shastra, which teaches us that the focal point of every ashrama is unique. For example, the focus of Brahmacharya ashram or the student life is education, learning, etc., so that we can prepare ourselves for the next phase. But it has to be grounded in discipline. It has to be grounded in discipline. This is the key takeaway from Brahmacharya Ashram. So as long as we are pursuing education, learning, so on, grounded in discipline, this gives us a focus for an individual who is in Brahmacharya Ashram. It will give her or him a focus whereby, whereby the uncertainties are reduced to some extent. Same in Grahastha Ashram. The focus is earning well, so that you are able to take care of the family, once again by dharmic means, and taking care of this family, advancing maybe your own uh, job, career prospects. And also interestingly, Vedanta Shastra explains to us that in addition to taking care of the family and the children, one of the things that the grahastha is also responsible for is taking care of the senior generation. Because these people may not be in a position to earn or they may have some physical uh, conditions whereby somebody else has to take care of them, at least financially. So it is a responsibility. It is an obligatory duty for those in Grahastha Ashram to take care, to manage both these generations. So once again, if the focal point of someone in Grahastha Ashram is I will do what is uh, right for me in my career and job, take care of my family, also take care of other members in society, in the community, to the best extent I can, then I can slowly, slowly advance myself into the next phase of life. I'm preparing for the next phase of life, which is the retirement phase, which is the Vanaprasthashram. Now in Vanaprasthashram, what is the focal point? It is now that we have completed all our duties, responsibilities, I'm now going to focus on my spiritual development, my spiritual growth. So my uh, spiritual practice or sadhana. So that becomes the focal point. So to some extent, all the other factors which are in the physical world around us, in the material world around us, they can uh, become less and less severe. So this is how, by understanding our role and responsibilities in each of the ashram, we are able to get some guidance, some certainty, and to that extent, get closer to the goal. So the whole idea is, every time we advance through these different phases, we should get closer to our ultimate goal of life, which is moksha, liberation, self-realization. Now. Sometimes we have this question, why do we do what we do? Why do I do what I do? What is motivating me? What is the source of my desires? What is the source of my thoughts? What is it that keeps me going every day? What is it that keeps me going actually in this life? And for that, Vedanta has a a very appropriate response, and this is a very profound idea, one of the deepest ideas in Vedanta, that is the 
idea of vasanas. Vasanas. The literal meaning in Sanskrit of vasana is fragrance, the lingering fragrance. Now, supposing somebody takes a, uh, a, a vase of fresh flowers and uh, goes through a room and they leave the room, even though the flowers are no longer in that room, there is a lingering fragrance that might remain from those flowers. Or if you take an agarbatti, an incense stick, and someone passes through the room, even after they have left the room, to some extent, there will be a lingering fragrance. So the, this is a metaphor for us to understand vasana, the meaning of vasana. So vasana in Vedanta Shastra, it, it means our inner urges, innate tendencies. And they're kind of hidden. They are not manifest yet. And it is explained that they are created from all our past thoughts and actions. Every past thought, every past action that we have had, it creates an impression in our personality. And these impressions get added on, added on. It becomes a storehouse, like a, like a database, if you will. So this storehouse, this database of our vasanas, which are created from all our past actions, thoughts and actions, the impressions left over, these are our vasanas. And they are the cause for our desires and thoughts and actions in the future. And because they are the cause, this storehouse of vasanas is called as the causal body, karana sharira. It's the causal body. In fact, it is the cause for our present life, our present desires, present thoughts. So the idea here is by getting understanding a little better that our vasanas are creating our thoughts and desires, we will get some clarity on how to manage our desires, which we thought, uh, which we addressed earlier in the kama phase. In artha, kama, we were thinking about the desires that we would like to uh, fulfill. Now, vasanas are, it's a very interesting thing. We have different people with, who might have different tendencies. Somebody might have, for example, a liking for music, love for music. So they will go about you know, humming tunes or listening to tunes. They're automatically drawn to uh, some music sources or orchestras or, or, or some other thing. So it, it is their innate nature. It is an inner uh, nerve, a urge. It, it is an inner urge or uh, inclination that they are drawn to music. So you cannot explain that simply by the external environment. So that could be the vasana of love of music. Also very interestingly, you might see people in the same household, two siblings, you know, two brothers, let's say. One person has a natural inclination liking for the field of discipline, uh, uh, discipline of uh, medicine, natural liking. So they want to pursue that field. They want to have an education, career in that field of medicine. Whereas the other sibling, same household, uh, he or she might have a natural liking for uh, the discipline of engineering. You've got medicine, engineering, same household, same circumstances, different likes. And the parent, the father might want them to become a lawyer <laughs> because, because he's a lawyer. So all different situations uh, in this family, but they will have different kinds of inclination. So where this, did this inclination come from? Where did this desire arise from? So the cause for that, it is explained as the vasanas. So how do we manage our desires in this life? By trying to get, get a better understanding of our vasana. So the first thing is we try and discover what this inner urge could be because it is hidden right now. It is not manifest. Once we discover it, we try to develop it. We try to grow it so that once it manifests into a desire, something that we want to act upon, and this is key. Once again, we act upon it in a dharmic way, 
So everything we do in artha is related to accomplishment of this desire, which is my innate urge. Everything that I try to accomplish in terms of material desires is related to this. And I'm doing all of these following dharma, dharmic rules, so that now we are aligned with the moksha, the highest goal of life. So by doing these, all these, once again, we get some certainty, we get some kind of guidance as to how we can go about reaching the highest goal in life, which is moksha. Now, once we are doing this, we are pursuing our life, we are living our lives, then the question can come, how do I know that I'm on this pathway to success? One simple way is, I mentioned earlier, is do we have a sense of inner peace, calm, contentment by doing this? If the answer is yes, then most likely yes, we are on the right path. Another indicator is while the individual is pursuing these activities uh, related to their karma, their desires, which are aligned with their vasanas, it gives them joy. They're happy simply because they are doing it, not because they're getting more money, not because they're getting a bonus, not because they're getting extra recognition, maybe, maybe not. But their contentment does not depend on this. They are happy, they are joyful, simply they are because they are doing this. Like the musician or somebody else pursuing some other kind of art form or the scientist working in the lab or any other profession that we may be in. That is another indicator. Another indicator is, this is very interesting, is while this individual is having fun, enjoying being joyful doing this particular activity, at the same time, he or she will be a source of joy to everybody else around him or her. This is very interesting. It is not that he or she intends to do this. Purposefully, I want to give joy to others. But by doing this, this activity simply flows out of love, out of inspiration deep inner motivation, when this activity is going, it simply becomes a source of joy to everybody else around them. So it is difficult to explain. If you say that this is the desire, this is what I wanted to accomplish, am I closer to success? Maybe, maybe not. But these are some indicators that we, will, we can follow to see where we are along this path. Now, another question that typically comes up is, how to, how to, how to do all these things? Are there any practical tips? Can I start doing something right now? Can I start doing something today? And Vedanta Shastra gives us three simple steps. They're simple, but they're very profound. Something that we can all follow. And these three steps are Shravanam, Mananam, and Nididhyasanam. These are popularly given in, in uh, the teachings of Vedanta. Literally, what Shravanam means is listening. So in the olden days, the tradition was the student would, would approach the teacher seeking this knowledge. And the tradition was through, it was through oral teaching. So they didn't have uh, uh, Zoom or, or, or YouTube or even uh, fancy classrooms at that time. So that was the tradition. Therefore, it was called Shravanam, meaning listening. So listening to this knowledge, typically this is uh, scriptural knowledge, the scriptural uh, texts of uh, where we can find this knowledge. So listening to this knowledge from an external source, because we don't know it right now. I want to gain this knowledge. So I become more knowledgeable about this subject matter. Now, in our context, we can interpret it in slightly different ways. Gaining knowledge from external source, it doesn't have to be oral tradition. We have other media right now. Supposing we read books by great spiritual masters who are giving us their teachings, explaining it 
interpreting it in different ways, helping us interpret it in our context, guiding us, that becomes also Shravanam. So we can be reading, we can be listening to audio, video, whatever is available, or satsang. In, in your, um, in, in uh, SVBF, in the, the Dhyanasudha uh, programs, you, uh, maybe you have weekly sessions, satsang, where like-minded people come and they can uh, discuss or, or, or listen to other people. We also have satsang uh, sessions here in the South Florida, in our uh, Shiva Vishnu temple. So that can be a source for Shravanam. Shravanam literally means gaining knowledge from the external source because we don't know these concepts yet. We don't have an understanding about these topics yet. So having gained this knowledge at the intellectual level, the next step is explained as mananam. Mananam is reflection, contemplation. Here, now we are reflecting on these topics, these new concepts that we have learned and trying to figure out, thinking, deeper about it, how do they apply to our lives? How can I make it work for me? And interestingly, while we are listening, things might be very clear. Great masters, if you listen to them, they explain it so beautifully. Read their books, beautifully explain. And yes, 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 I've understood it. That is how we feel. But the moment we, we think about it a little more, there are these doubts and questions. Some of them are so subtle, we don't even know it is a doubt or a question yet. They begin to arise in the mind. That's a good thing. That's an indicator that we are doing mananam after uh, shravanam. So while we do mananam, these doubts and questions are slowly, slowly erased. Then we go back to shravanam. So this is a cyclical process. We do shravanam, gain the new knowledge, then we spend some time in, in mananam, which is the contemplation, reflection. Then having understood more, we go back to more shravanam. So the same text, the, the same uh, talk by a great master, if you listen to it the second time, third time, it is going to reveal deeper and deeper knowledge. Some things which I hadn't thought about yet. So that means we are now gaining this knowledge. We are enriching our own experience of this Vedanta knowledge. Now, having done this sufficiently, Shravanam and Mananam, that naturally leads us to the third step, which is Nididhyasanam. Nididhyasanam is a meditation. Meditation, it's explained by uh, Swami Chidmananji, it is a state of a being. It's a state of being. But for us, when we practice meditation, we, we sit and then we do uh, guided meditation, silent meditation. That is the practice of meditation for us. So it is through meditation, this is very important, it is through meditation that we can internalize this knowledge that we have gained from an external source. This is key. If we don't internalize it, then at the time when we need this knowledge, when we need to apply it in crisis situations in our lives, difficult situations in our lives, that knowledge will not be Available. For example, we might be reading uh, uh, Sri Bhagavad Gita, a great spiritual master might have explained it to us. And then it says, Samatva, be calm. Treat you know, all situations in life the same. Depend on the intellect, your discriminatory factor, so you can make the right decisions and choices. Very good. It's very convincing. The moment I go and try and apply it, it doesn't work. Next day I go to work. And somebody is, uh, uh, you know, is, is mean to me or, or they said something or did something which I did not expect. Immediately, my mood changes. I get angry, I get bitter, I get disappointed, I get sad. doesn't work. If you're driving on I-95, I-95 is one of the uh, busiest expressways that we have in uh, South Florida. Actually, all over the eastern uh, part of U.S. Driving on South Florida, uh, on uh, I-95, and then we have some uh, important meeting, appointment. Somebody cuts you off. Cuts you off in the expressway. Suddenly you lose it. <laughs> I've been listening to, to these great talks, but then at that time I, I lose it. You know, and then you have all these things, road rage and all these things going on. 
So not good, not good. So at the moment when I need it, is this knowledge available to me? If the answer is no, then Swami Tejavananji says, we have to go back. Do Shravanam Mananam Nididhyasana. Once again, we follow these three steps. Slowly, slowly, we will begin to see that this knowledge has become part of me, internalized it. So that when I need it, when I need to apply it, it's right there, it is available. So Swami uh, Teja Mahananji gives an interesting example. So once there was a dinner party and everybody had a uh, nice meal, they were sitting down and relaxing. And there was a young man, he uh, had this after dinner coffee so he was sipping his uh, coffee and uh, it was very bitter. So there was a nice, uh, you know, wise old man sitting next to him. So he asked him, uh, young man, what happened? So this, this coffee is very bitter. I don't enjoy it. So uh, the old wise old man, he said, see, there is sugar there. You put one or two servings of sugar and this bitterness will go. So this young man, he went there, he added one or two uh, teaspoons of sugar and then again he came down and he sipped it. Once again it was bitter. He said, oh it is still bitter. So the wise old man told him, did you stir the coffee? Young man, did you stir the coffee? He said, no. So he told him, you go there, there is a stirrer, stir the coffee and then taste the coffee. So once again this young man, he went there, he got a stirrer, stirred it then he sipped the coffee. Ah, it's nice and sweet. Nice and sweet. Because the sugar had dissolved into the coffee now. So this is a metaphor. This can be a metaphor for our own lives. The sugar, which came from an external source, is the knowledge, divine knowledge, knowledge of Vedanta, Vedanta Shastra. But this is still external. So we add it to this bitter coffee. Bitter can be our life experiences. Where, where, where we are angry, we are sad, we are disappointed, we have likes and dislikes, all these things are going on, Raga Devesha, uh, these things are going on in our life. So it is bitter to that extent. So you add this coffee to this, uh, uh, you add this sugar to this coffee, and then you stir it, stir it, dissolve it, internalize it. So now the sugar has become one with the coffee. Just like that, the knowledge has to become one with us, assimilate this knowledge, integrate this knowledge, so it becomes one with us. So this divine knowledge, Vedanta knowledge, having done this, it becomes one part of us. So when the time arises, when I need to use it, I can readily apply it. So this is a, a, another takeaway message which we gain from uh, Vedanta, teachings of Vedanta Shastra. So it, it is uh, an hour. Uh, now, I'm going to close here. I'm going to close with uh, our closing prayers. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamiva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Om Shri Guru Bhyo Nama. Thank you so much, Dr. Gudi, for this very interesting topic, very interesting way you explained it. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I loved the way you explained the secret of success, uh, the dharma, artha, ka, artha, kama, dharma, and moksha, particularly dharma, and also the way you explained uh, the secret of the success, which is the charanam, mananam, and uh, nididhyasanam. Uh, in fact, you have explained it everything so well. Uh, I don't see any questions coming from the audience. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we, <clears throat> we would love to have you again sometime uh, in the next couple of uh, months, probably. This was very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, can I request Gopinath to please propose a vote of thanks? Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. On behalf of SPBF Canada, um, I'm Gopinath. I take the opportunity uh, to thank Professor Arvind Goody 
for making time for us and uh, really enlightening us uh, by drawing parallels uh, from the Upanishads and the Vedas. Um, and uh, I understand personally the four phases that you mentioned about the Purusharthas. In fact, uh, I feel the word dharma being the foremost, always we say dharmartha, kama moksha in all our uh, spiritual uh, ceremonies when we start off, that I feel dharma is given the most important focus in all of this. Uh, though we focus on artha in various phases of life to start with. So you've really, uh, you know, distilled it so well for this audience here and made it so simple. Uh, you know, sometimes taking these profound concepts as you outlined and distilling it for the audience is a real challenge. And I think you've done a marvelous job of putting that across to us. And uh, I, would be, I would be really wanting to listen to you more um, in, the, in the days to come. And, you know, I hope the, there is an opportunity within the organization and outside as well to be able to uh, listen to you more. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for, for sharing your thoughts here. And uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> a couple of things that also struck with me and stayed with me would be, um, you know, how we interpret success. I think you, you touched upon the fact that we need to look at success through the eyes of others. Uh, in terms of being, in, in terms of others being successful and see the joy that it brings forth to the entire audience. And I think that's another facet that I see, uh, you know, we see it in the corporate world where, you know, we look at success in a certain way. Um, but, you know, when we look at success through the eyes of others, it, it makes a lot more sense. And, and I, I think your speech here today also touches upon that. And thank you very much again for bringing that uh, aspect to, to us. And uh, I also want to thank the audience here for, you know, being very active in um, listening to this uh, very timely and uh, important uh, session. And uh, also the Jnana Sudha panel led by Dr. Alakananji, who is the architect behind this monthly session. Um, it's a series that we've started a couple of years, almost a year and a half back. And, uh, you know, we're having this session on a monthly basis. And the message this month from you about the success and how we need to interpret success is a very timely one. Thank you very much. And, uh, and to the audience and to the participants here, our next uh, Gyana Sudha lecture is going to be on the 11th of December. It's going to be by Dr. Hema Ganapati. Uh, please look to, look forward uh, to that uh, invite and uh, please participate in the session. And thank you very much for the Nyana uh, participants. Thank you. Yeah. With this, we adjourn the session today. <laughs>